Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here to talk to you today about NECA and uh, it was great for Steve to release me out of the basement for a couple of days. So um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what NECA is and what it can, some of the things it can give you. Um, that's a very high level list of the things we can do for you. Um, it's across multiple languages. It's the, 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 the core language is C++, but it, is, it does have Python bindings and it has a JavaScript binding that is maturing. We've had a little bit of trouble with it, but it's almost there. So specifically a threshold signature and a threshold signature scheme. What, what is it? What does it mean? It's based on a piece of cryptography that was developed over 40 years ago called multi-party computation or MPC. This allows multiple parties who don't like each other, who don't trust each other, to share some data and not reveal anything private about themselves, but to come up with a public shared secret or shared function. There are many properties of, a, of an MPC. The two most important ones are correctness and privacy. So correctness from the point of view that if you take some input, you get a, the correct and expected output from your algorithm, and privacy, so you reveal no secrets. You only reveal what you want to reveal. So if we take the MPC idea and try to apply it to key generation and signature generation, what does it mean? It means we're doing three things. We're generating keys, the output of which is a public key and some shared secrets, and we're signing, we're generating a signature, and we're verifying. If you take all those steps together, the composition of all those steps, that is what we call a threshold signature scheme. So the, the thing we're trying to replace, or the thing we're trying to emulate, is the standard EC DSA signing algorithm. Uh, this is well known, well understood, widely used, and it has two simple inputs, which is a private key and a message. The method inside in the, in the, in the algorithm is it takes the private key and it generates an, infer an inferral, blah, blah, blah. I'll get that word out eventually, uh, key, it's a one-time only use key, and then we, which is an EC point on the elliptic curve, then we take an R value, we take the X coordinate of that, call that little r, and we execute the, uh, the formula that's in step three. The output of that are, is a point which has two components, an R and an S value. You take those two together, that's an EC DSA signature. With threshold signatures, the idea is exactly the same, except now you don't have a single private key. The private key has been split into multiple shares, and these can be distributed across multiple parties or players. Then each participant will execute those steps. He'll take his private key, he'll take the message, and he'll output an R1 and an S1 value. The signature is then the combination of all those. There's a bit of mathematical magic, mathematical magic going on in here, which is the private key never existed, which took me a long time to get my head around, but when, you, when, you, when that does finally sink in, it means that you've eliminated a massive security hole, which is the private key, because it's never existed, it can never be stolen, it can never be abused. So here's a visual representation of what we're trying to do. So the top line shows um, a reconstruction of a private key. So you have some key shares, and any two of the three shares can be brought together to reconstruct a private key. If you wish to sign something, all three parties have to come back together. That's what this diagram is trying to show. These can then be distributed across multiple devices, multiple geographic locations. You can give one to a trusted th third party. One can be a wallet server. It totally depends on what your application is. Um, so I have a few pictures of what I think it looks like. So you take a group of N players, each player has a public label, and each player has a secret, which he does not reveal to anyone. They, there are several rounds of communication where they share some parts of their information, which I'll go through in a minute. We call this the MPC process, and what pops out the other end is the shared public key. Now if you want to create a signature, you can do that with a subgroup. Now, you'll see this number kicking around, this 2t plus 1. I'll explain that a bit more in a minute. But you take a subgroup and the message, you feed it into uh, a, a, another round of distributed calculations, and what comes out the other end is your R and your S value. 
So the key points to, to take away are we have a group of M players where two T plus one of them are signers. And the T again, it's a bit hard to explain. In mathematical terms, the T is the degree of the polynomial that each player has. The T plus one is the recombination threshold if you wish to rebuild the private key. And the two T plus one is the signing. And the two T plus one has to be less or equal to the number of players in the group. So this is what gives you a two of three, a three of three. That's where that terminology starts to come from. A key, the key, key feature of all of this is that the private key never existed. It's a huge security plug. And also, the threshold signature is completely indistinguishable from a single signer signature. So it reveals nothing about the number of people who are participating and contributing to the signature. So how do we combine all this with blockchain? In practice, you can basically replace all, pri if you wish to, you can replace all private key related commands with distributed computations. So it's a set of n parties working together to produce the, the public key. From the public key, you can then derive blockchain addresses in the traditional way. So the blockchain now becomes agnostic to the signature. The same can be said of the signing, the, the signer party. It doesn't have to be a single transaction any longer. We can run the distributed signature process between parties. And once enough of them are behaving correctly, you will have a, you will have a valid signature. Of course, with every new piece of technology, I'm not going to say it's perfect. There are, of course, risks. Um, it hasn't been battle tested in the wild. Um, there aren't that many implementations of it out there. Um, I'm not a hacker. I don't have the mindset of it, to be honest. But I'm sure there are people out there who will come up with unthought of uh, attack vectors. It's a risk we have to take. We have to acknowledge. But as new implementations come along, they will be better. They will be peer reviewed. Uh, attack vectors will be understood. The performance will improve, I think, um, dramatically. So it really opens up this technology. So specifically in the Nakasando solution, I'd like to walk you through the algorithm as quickly as I can. Um, this is a, a demonstration only, as I only have two players on the screen, but you can't do it with two people. You need a minimum of three people to, to, uh, to implement the threshold scheme. But um, as you'll see in a minute, there are a lot of arrows, so the more people you put in, the more complicated the diagram looked. I, I could barely explain it myself. So the first thing we have to do is generate a shared secret between two parties. So we have Alice and Bob. Each one picks their label. And each player picks a, pri a polynomial. Now, the thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to share the sum of the constants in the polynomial. But they can't share them directly. That's revealing the secret. So they have to come up with a different way of doing this. So what they do is they calculate what we call fi of xj. What that means is they take the label of the other person and they evaluate their polynomial to get one number. And then they swap this number. So now each person has some information that relates to the other person. Now they take their own label and they run through the same, their own polynomial to generate another number. And they apply that very simple calculation at the end, which is they sum up what they got from the other person plus their own calculation to get two, two more numbers, the four and the five in this case. They then combine that into a point and they swap them. You then have to do what's called a Lagrange interpolation for the zero point. And what pops out at the end is fx, if you take x equal to zero at that point, you'll get fx equal to three, which are the two numbers in red, the sum of the two numbers. So what we have here is they have exchanged some information and without revealing the secret. But how can you trust the other person? You can't just take his word for it. So each player sends some more information to each other. They encrypt their own coefficients by multiplying it by uh, the g in this case is the generator point of the elliptic curve. And they run, they create the, uh, how do you explain this? They take the labels and they run it through their own polynomial. They encrypt those and they exchange those as well. And then they have to apply this kind of nasty looking formula. So the, the pieces on the left, on the right, sorry, are publicly known. The, pe the pieces on the left are known only to each player. And if this sum doesn't hold true, then someone in the group is lying and you can call the whole scheme off at this point. Before you go any further, it can be called off. So it has an inbuilt security mechanism at this point. 
If you combine all that together, we refer to that as Joint Verifiable Random Secret Sharing, or JVRSS. That pops up a bit more later. This is essential to the scheme because it enforces honesty among the players and enforces correctness amongst the data that they share. If you get to this step, you can pretty much trust everyone in the group. So now we're going to generate the MFRL key and some pre-signature data. So again, remember, for the ECDSA, we have three variables that need to go in. We need a private key, we need a single-use random key, and we need the message. So the public key uh, is generally, well, it's an EC point, and it's the private key times G, but obviously we can't do that. So we need to derive a public key. And the public key is simply the sum of the coefficients multiplied by G. Now, there's a bit of uh, elliptic curve magic going on here, but it's commutative. So the formula at the bottom holds true, which is if you take a point and you multiply it by G, then that is equal to the point summed then multiplied by G. Does that make sense? Uh, so we can, and because we've done the secret sharing in the previous round, we, can, we know this is true. So now we calculate this single-use MFRL key. Um, so what they want to do is we, well, what happens is we run another secret sharing, which are all the steps previously described, to generate a K value. And what they want to do is they want to share this K value, but they can't. This is a single-use private key, and it reveals too much to the other parties. So we do another round of JVRSS to generate something called a blinding value alpha. So now we have three secrets rattling around in our system. Each person performs the steps here, which is they take their K, multiply it by alpha, they take their alpha, they multiply it by G, and then they exchange all of those values, and they perform this interpolation. They evaluate it for zero, and what they get at the end is this R, this magic R value that is one input into our signature. And you team up the R with the, with the K, which is called a private key share. Now you take both of those together, and that is a partial signature. So now we want to sign the message. So again, this is the formula that we're going to use, very similar to the previous uh, ECDSA. So each party agrees on the message M, and then they take their K, and each party plugs it into the formula, and they get their S value. They then send all this back to the person who requested it in the first place, and that person now has the valid signature, which is R and the S. So this is the bit of, of the demo that I was dreading the most, in that I'm going to try and do all that with mainnet, which is exciting. So uh, I'm hoping that someone will switch the screen so you can see my screen. Thank you. So um, I hope it's big enough. Let me try and walk you through what's going to happen. So I have a program that's going to simulate the threshold signature group. Um, the size of the group is going to be randomly chosen. So just so you know that there's nothing too much going on, hidden behind the scenes. So when we execute it, it's going to choose a signing threshold of 123 and a group size of 129. So the reason these are so big is I wanted to show you that the algorithm is actually quite quick under the covers. I should also point out that this is all built with Naxando. So everything that we're doing is using the Naxando library. So what's happened here in these steps is that we've created a public key, and then I've dumped it, and I've recovered it from the 2t plus 1. So 61, 62 of the group have, come, have been chosen at random. They've come back together, and they've regenerated the public key. So this is the next step, where the, each player is now going to derive their key shares. And now they're going to exchange all of that information. We actually do it in two bursts to, to try and minimize the amount of communication that's going on between them. So that's it. So 129 players have now exchanged all of that information that we spoke about. So what I'm going to do is We're going to take this public key, and we're going to create a wallet on mainnet. So I'm now going to use CentB, I think they're in the room, to, uh, to fund the wallet.
not by too much, just in case. So I'm going to fund that with 1,400 Satoshis. Should pop up in a minute. Done. So unfortunately, this is the piece where the library is still a bit lacking in that we now use what's on chain to pull back the funding transaction and the unsigned transaction that I'm now going to sign with our threshold group. So I'm going to take all of this, which is the, signing the funding transaction. And I'm going to take this, which is the uh, unspent, unsigned transaction. So once I put that in, you'll see a whole lot of stuff fly by on the screen. So what I'm trying to show with this is that to generate the signature, now that we've gone through all the pain of sharing all that information up front, is now really quick. So the message has been signed. A transaction has been created, which I'll talk about more in a second. This bit at the bottom, I've just put in to show that the signature now looks no different from an ECDSA. So I've taken the information that we created with all that data sharing from further up and stuffed it into the regular ECDSA signing algorithm. And this is what popped out the other end. So now we can take this transaction. Go to what's on chain to broadcast it. And hopefully, success. So that is now a threshold signature signed transaction. If we take a quick look. <laughs> if we take a quick look at this number here. Stage is really big. This is the number of signatures required to spend that, which is one. So the transaction is a, st is a standard sized tiny transaction. It reveals nothing about who has signed it or the number of signatures required to spend the money. But if you recall, our group size was 123. So there's 123 signatures are part of that. So it's a very powerful scheme. It has lots of use cases, um, obvious ones like board members. Um, how many do you need? Do you need all of them, some of them? That's up to the application. It has the, you can implement voting schemes. You can do all sorts of stuff. Uh, very powerful and all driven by the Naxando SDK. Thank you for listening, and uh, I hope to see you soon.